Good evening, everyone. Good to have you all out this evening. Let's take our Bibles. Let's take our hymnals. And we'll take our Bibles later. But let's take our hymnals at this time and turn to number 375. 375. Work for the night is coming. Number 375. Work for the night is coming, work through the morning hours, work while the dew is sparkling, work mid springing flowers, work when the day grows brighter, work in the glowing sun. Work for the night is coming When man's work is done Work for the night is coming Work through the sunny noon Fill brighter stars with labor Rest comes sure and soon Give every flying minute Something to keep in store Work for the night is coming When man works no more Work for the night is coming Under the sunset skies while their bright dreams are glowing Work for daylight flies Work till the dust beam faded Fadeth to shine no more Work for the night is darkening When man's work is o'er now let's turn back to number 44. 44, we'll work till Jesus comes. <laughs> oh, land of rest for thee, I sigh, when will the moment come? When I shall lay my armor by and dwell in peace at home, we'll work till Jesus comes, we'll work till Jesus comes, we'll work till Jesus comes and we'll be gathered home. To Jesus Christ I fled for rest, he bade me cease to roam, and lean for succor on his breast till he conduct me home. We'll work till Jesus comes, we'll work till Jesus comes, we'll work. Till Jesus comes and will be gathered home. I sought at once my Savior's side, no more my steps shall roam. With him I'll brave death's jailing tide and reach my heavenly home. We'll work till Jesus comes, we'll work, till Jesus comes, we'll work, till Jesus comes and we'll be gathered home. Man, let's take our Bibles at this time for our memory verse and turn to the book of Joshua, chapter 1 and verse 8. Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8. And let's repeat our verse four times. Let's begin. 
Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. Make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. And let's look to the Lord, shall we? Father, we pray tonight for your power to be on your word, and we thank you that it is. We thank you for your presence. We thank you that you have a plan and a purpose for our lives. We thank you you've given us a book to guide us, to direct us, that we might know thy will by thy word through the power of the Holy Spirit. Pray, Lord, for those missing tonight with illness. We think of, of Anne who called to say that she was having some issues with headaches in her neck. We do pray for Sammy and Rachel that, Lord, you would continue to raise them up. Pray, Lord, for Nita, of course, and, Lord, that thou would work out the details for her and for her kidneys. Others, Lord, who are ill tonight, those who are working, those who are away from us, those who are here. Pray for the children in the nursery, nursery worker for strength. And Lord, we ask you now to open thy word to us. Thank you for each precious family represented here tonight. We also, Lord, want to remember to pray for Mervic as she'll be leaving to go to do her practicum in Edmonton. We ask, Lord, that You'll give her a good time there. I know it's going to be difficult for her leaving her children. And Lord, but thy grace is sufficient. May she experience that. May you give her journey of mercies as she travels. And then, Lord, we ask you to uh, meet our needs collectively as a church family as we look to thee for physicality. And Lord, we all, from the youngest to the oldest, suffer with afflictions these bodies certainly humble us and yet we praise you and thank you for the magnificence of this body that you have made for us we pray for financial need and lord as we look to you and wait on you we pray for those waiting on thee for employment pray that doors would be open and then lord most importantly tonight we pray that you will deal with us uh, spiritually, that we will grow in grace and the knowledge of our Savior. We pray for our premier, and Lord, as she uh, gets under her feet the need of this province, Lord, as she's already being attacked by news and, and liberals and people who like to fuss. Pray you'll give her strength. We pray for her salvation. 
and the word we do. Pray now that you bless our service in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11, and we gave you introduction last week, verses 1 through 3. We saw, of course, the explanation about faith, and then we saw that the elders, verse 2, uh, received a good report card, and they obtained a good report by faith. And then verse 3, through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. God spoke and it came about. And uh, how magnificent and wonderful that is to think, just to think of creation and all that it entails. And then if you think about our bodies, I thought about that this week and read some uh, very provocative and uh, important information about our bodies as we think of these bodies that God has made for us. Miraculous. Uh, no way that some amoeba billions of years ago slime turned into this body. We have a creator and we thank the Lord for him. And then Paul begins to give us some information about those who have gone on before us, starting, of course, in the Old Testament. And he brings four characters out right away. And uh, that, of course, is uh, Abel. <clears throat> and then Enoch, the seventh from Adam. And then Noah. And then, of course, verse 6 is uh, very provoking. Uh, without faith, you can't please the Lord. We know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And then the longest section of this 40 verse chapter is about Abraham. So I wanna give these uh, personages before us and then we'll go and see the difference between a family and two brothers. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice then Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. Well, his gift, of course, was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead, yet speaketh. And we'll find that in Genesis 4. And then in Genesis 5, we'll find Lamech's son, by faith Enoch, by the way, Enoch's father lived to be 962 years old, uh, just a little bit longer than Adam, who lived 930, and just seven years short of Methuselah, who lived 969 years. Imagine being 900 years old and how much you would know and uh, be amazing. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him before, for before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it's impossible to please him, God, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them which diligently, diligently seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, that fear there was not that he was afraid of God, but that he reverenced him and was in all of him, prepared an ark. And this is a very controversial verse on the matter of work salvation. He prepared an ark. So I guess works and faith go together. However, Genesis 6 tells us that Noah found grace. So Noah was saved before he built the ark. <clears throat> For preparing the ark to the saving of his house. Vernon McGee gives a great illustration about <clears throat> Noah because Noah preached for 120 years and got no converts. Yet J. Vernon McGee said he won his boys, 
who won their wives, so he did have converts. And thank the Lord, his family got in the ark. All of his family got in the ark. And you can certainly claim your family with Acts 16, 31. When the jailer said to Paul and Silas, what must they do to be saved? They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. So one of the great priorities, I believe, for every child of God is to make sure that our families get in. I read it again. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith, of the righteousness which is by faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should ask to receive for an inheritance, obeyed, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whither he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age or menopause because she judged him faithful who had promised as you read through these 40 verses we're not going to read through all of them this evening but as you read through them underscore that word promise so she judged him faithful who had promised therefore sprang there even of one and him as good as dead abraham was a hundred she was 90 so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and, in the, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. Can't count the sand, can't count the stars. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them and embraced them, and confess that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from which they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better. And of course, the theme of Hebrews is better. They, they desire a better country that is in heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he had prepared for them a city. My kind of city that's going to be. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, on this in Genesis chapter 22, offered up Isaac as he that received the promises, offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, that in Isaac should thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. So Abraham was raising that knife up to slay his son, believing that God would resurrect his son, and yet God held his hand, and one of the Jehovah names and is Jehovah Jireh, God sees and God provides. According that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which also he received him in a figure. And of course, that figure, of course, is the Lord Jesus. And Father, we pray now that you open the Bible to us. Speak to us. Challenge our faith and our walk with thee. For without faith, it's impossible to please thee. Bless now the preaching and teaching of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So think about the family of these two brothers. Find Genesis 
chapter number 3. Genesis chapter number 3. So we know the story. Adam and Eve fell in the garden. And between the fall and the flood, Enoch comes on the scene. But here in chapter 3, Satan came on the scene and disrupted the fellowship of Adam and Eve with God the Father. And he's been doing that ever since. So they fell. So God in his great mercy, his great mercy, made a way for Adam and Eve to be saved. Verse chapter 3, and we'll just look at verse 21. Unto Adam also, and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. Look at verse 15. So the fall, and now the promise Messiah. And I will put enmity, the first promise of the gospel, and a savior in the Bible. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between, notice, thy seed and her seed, and shall bruise, it shall bruise thy head, that's future, that hasn't happened yet. Satan is not the God of hell. Satan is the God of this world that is like hell, but he's not in hell yet. It shall bruise thy head. That's the seed of the woman. That's the virgin born son of God. And thou shall bruise his heel. That has taken place, the crucifixion of our Lord. So there's the promise of salvation and the promise of the Savior. And God said to Adam and Eve, I'm going to give you a seed. And that seed is going to bruise the head of the serpent. And of course, the serpent will bruise the heel of the Savior, the Messiah. Now we come to chapter 4. And in chapter 4, Eve assumed that she has now conceived, and she has the Messiah. That's what she thought. Look what it says. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, that is, they were together in the marriage contract, and she conceived and bare Cain. Now watch this. So the first child, the oldest child, is Cain. And said, she said, I have gotten the man. I know the Bible says a man, so I'm not doing despite to the Bible. I begot the man. I have the Messiah. Very rapidly, very quickly, the Messiah has come. It's all over. And good news. No. No. I have gotten the man from the Lord. So here's the firstborn son. His name is Cain. Jude talks about the way of Cain. First John, keep your finger here and go with me to the book of First John. And we find that John, of course, this wonderful epistle, this five chapter epistle, talks, of course, about the fact of love and how we're to love one another. And then in chapter 3 and verse number 11, for this is the message, the message, that you heard from the beginning that we should what? Love one another. John 13, after Jesus washed the disciples' feet and Judas, the betrayer, he said, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples when you have love one for another. Now, notice what John writes. 
John, the youngest disciple who's now up in his 90s, wrote five books of the Bible. Five books of the Bible. The Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and the book of the Revelation, the final book of the canon of Scripture. Notice what it says now, verse 11, I'll read again. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Now notice, not, see, not as Cain, who was the, of that wicked one. Remember, John 13, after Jesus has washed Judas' feet, Satan enters into him. So Cain was of the wicked one and slew his brother. Wherefore slew he him because his works, because his own works were evil. Whose works? Cain and his brother's righteous. We just read that in Hebrews chapter 4, chapter 11, verse 4. Now turn to the book of Jude, the little book of Jude. This tremendous book written by one of our Lord's half-brothers, Jude. Verse 8. Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, speak evil, evil of dignitaries. Yet Michael the archangel, when consenting with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Dost not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. Even Michael, powerful angel, the Lord rebuke thee. I feel bad for these Pentecost people. I don't think they're much in casting out demons like they used to back in the 60s and 70s. But uh, you jump on the devil and he'll jump on you. <laughs> And uh, they don't uh, carry snakes anymore because too many of them have died. <clears throat> but these speak evil of those things which they know not, but which they know naturally as brute beasts. And those things that corrupt themselves, woe, woe unto them, for they have gone the way of Cain, apostasy. They've gone the way of Cain. Cain. So Cain then, how wicked he was. Let's go back now to Genesis 4. So two brothers. Two brothers in a home of the first man and the first woman. The perfect man and the perfect woman until they fell. And because Adam fell, you fell. And every buddy since Adam and Eve is born a descendant of Adam and Eve and therefore born a sinner. We sin because we're sinners. I heard people witnessing the people and they say, well, you do this, do that. We do what we do because we are, we are we're sinners. We are born sinners. Romans 5, 12 says, wherefore as by one man sin entered the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for all of sin. We're sinners. Romans 5, 19, wherefore, as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so that by the obedience of one should many be made righteous. That's the Lord Jesus. Now, here are these two brothers, born in the home of Adam and Eve. Born in a home of saved parents. Born in an environment and that's not how they fell. These environmentalists drive me, well, they don't drive me crazy, I just don't, I ignore them. This environmentalist foolishness, I like to say to those people, if I had the power to say it, uh, don't drive anymore, park your car, don't take an airplane, uh, just kind of paddle down the river the next time you visit Fort McMurray. I like to say that to them. and. Uh, those folks are going to be in for the shock of their lives. 
Revelation 9, when God opens up hell and those scorpions come out, those demons come out, and the world turns dusty and dirty and dark, they're going to be in for the shock of their life. So I say that in, in kindness and love, but they don't want God. They want nothing to do with God. If the government wanted God, they could have God. If the school system wanted God, they could have God. But people who reject God and reject the Spirit of God and the Son of God and the people of God, they're doomed. They're doomed. We can't help them. And, uh, and remember, Jeremiah said, uh, God said, Jeremiah, don't pray for those folks. I do pray for our government. I pray for our mayor, our premier. I pray for uh, um, countries around the world. You know this. I pray for them every day. I pray for Pierre. I don't know if he's going to be a good guy, bad guy, or what he's going to be. And I pray for Pinocchio. <laughs> Who is Pinocchio? Biden. I've given him a new name, Pinocchio. <laughs> and uh, he's such a liar. And uh, liars are fire. Have <laughs> you noticed this week? I sent the verse in Proverbs about lies. I put a pointed nose there. That's Pinocchio. So the Lord impressed me to say, my sister, one of my sisters calls him O Biden. O Biden after Obama. So I'm a bad man, and uh, but I'm exposing for what they are. They're liars, and uh, they're going to stand before God. So I was saying then, you think about this family, Adam and Eve now. God has covered them. They began, you know, like begets like, somewhat. And if you think about this home, here are two brothers. You can't blame grandpa and grandma because there was no grandpa and no grandma. They had no grandparents. All they had was their mom and dad. Uh, and when we, we think about that, uh, we know and we understand that uh, Adam and Eve, look ch back to chapter 3, remember they were in fellowship. If we could get this in our soul, deep down in our soul, that Satan hates you reading your Bible. Read your Bible, you know what he's all about. Satan hates your love to Jesus. Satan hates the fellowship. Satan hates the family. He's destroyed government, destroyed the school system as we know it. And so we need to be mindful of that. And we need to understand Religion hates Christ and Christianity. You need to understand that. If you understand that, then you're on good ground because Cain shows us religion. Here are those two boys in the same home. And, uh, and one is a rebel and disobedient and denies the blood. And you know, that's the Catholic Church. They deny the blood. They have mass, but there's no blood. Without the shedding of blood is no remission for sin. You've got to come by way of the blood. Now notice, if you will, verse 7, Genesis 3. And this is familiar ground to us, but I think it, it helps us when we look at Cain and the Cainites. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew they were naked. Up until that time, they were innocent. Not sinless, and by the way, every child born is not sinless. They're innocent until that age of accountability. That's why we must bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I'm so delighted, so thankful for Auntie Levy, who said, let's teach these children in the nursery. Let's get those three, four, and five-year-olds, and let's put the word of God in their heart. And what a blessing that is, and how responsible parents are to get the word of God into their children's heart, to teach them, instruct them and bring them up in the nurture and admission of the Lord. And they sowed fig leaves, there you have it. So fig leaves and made themselves aprons. So they tried to cover their sins. You cannot cover your sins with works. They tried it. You cannot tr cover your sins with fruit. Cain tried it. You can't cover your sin with vegetables. Cain tried it, and they heard the voice of the Lord 
God, Jehovah, Jehovah, Elohim, walking in the garden the cool of the day. I have no idea how long they fellowshiped with the Lord. I don't know how long they were in the garden before Satan showed up, but they fellowshiped every day and God taught them. And they enjoyed the fellowship. They enjoyed their bodies. They enjoyed creation. And it was a wonderful place. Your home ought to be heaven on earth. And how sad it is that so many homes are hell on earth. And, uh, and those little darlings that you sent off to the schools. And they corrupt them and send them back into your home as missionaries of the environment and global warming and all this trance foolishness. How very sad it is. These poor children need to pray much for them. Need to pray much for your children. Need to love much for your children. You need to protect your children and watch over them and make sure they go to school and not with a good lunch only, but with the word of God in their hearts. How imperative and how important. I wish we had enough finances that we could have a Christian school. And, uh, and those of you who homeschool, that's a difficult thing to do also. But the schools just corrupt them, turn them against you. And just think about these children. They're, when they listen to their media, uh, their iPads and their, and their uh, iPhones and all the stuff they listen to, so anti-God and anti-parents, and they get sucked up into it. And uh, they're vulnerable because they're not reading their Bible. They're not praying. They're not walking with God. And so many of God's people have given up, turned their back on God and the things of God. And those poor children are, are, are defenseless and they're helpless. And they go into these schools with the bunches. Well, not every teacher is bad for sure, but majority of them sure are. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden the cool of the day and Adam and his wife, what did they do? They hid. Sin keeps you from your Bible. Sin keeps you from praying. If our church needs a revival, it needs a revival in prayer. I'm praying that we will arrive early, the men, and I'm praying that we'll begin to pray. I'm glad you men are here tonight. We'll begin to pray for the men of our church. If I, if I could say anything to you, it would be, let's pray for the men of our church and for those men who don't come, for those men who are lost, for those men who are totally backslidden, God help. Listen, if you don't have the father, you don't have the home. If you don't have the dad, you don't have the home. And so if there's anything that we need to do, and I'm saying tonight, uh, we need to show up early, men, and we need to pray uh, before we go to preaching. And we need to have some prayer time. And uh, that's so important, no prayer, no power. And I'm guilty of that. I'm guilty of that. And I'm the pastor, so I'm going to face God for that. But I, I've just been so convicted lately about the importance of praying. Now, I pray. I wake up early and I pray. But I, I feel that maybe I haven't let our people as much as I should on the matter of praying. Praying. Praying for your marriage and praying for your family. And I don't believe our city will ever see a revival. I don't believe there'll be a revival, but I believe we can have a revival in our soul. I believe we can have a revival in our church if we do right, but there is no revival coming in the world. Destruction is coming in the world. The greatest revival, the greatest revival that will ever come to the world will be during the tribulation. That will be a great revival. But those revivals from the 18, 19, do you know there was a time when the Salvation Army was about souls? There was a time when the Salvation Army was street preaching, not just collecting your money, but there was a time when the Salvation Army was right with God. There was a time when the Pentecostals were right with God. You know, the Baptists aren't the only ones, uh, and there's so many Baptists today that have just walked away. They should take Baptists off their church name. Are you okay? I'm okay. So they hid from God. Sin hides the face of God. If I regard inequity in my heart, the Lord won't hear me. He that covereth the sin shall not prosper, but he that confesseth and forsaketh shall have mercy. So here they are. They're hiding from the presence of the Lord 
and the blessings of the Lord. And the blessings of the Lord. They're hiding in the trees. They, those trees were their food back then. No animals until after chapter 9. So notice, from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden, the blessings, all those trees, all those trees. Why didn't they eat from the tree of life? Wouldn't that have been nice, tree of life, be no death, be no sorrow, be no hell, but they didn't. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard that voice in the garden, I was afraid. Because I was naked, and I hid myself. Now for time, jump over to uh, verse 17. Verse 17, well, verse 16, ladies, conception. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. And sorrow shall thou bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. That's not he's the king of the castle, you're the dirty rascal, but that means he's managed the home. He's going to stand before God. That's what we need to pray for the men of our church, lost men of our church. I pray every day for specifically for the men of our church, the, the, the husbands of the ladies who come to our church, they come alone. And because their husbands are either lost or so backslidden that... Uh, how difficult it is for those children to see a double standard in their homes, too. Verse 17, unto Adam he said, now watch this, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife. What's the problem there? Didn't listen to God's voice. He listened to Eve's voice. Who listened to Satan's voice? Thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and hast eaten of the tree which I commanded Chapter 2, verse 16, God commanded, don't eat. If you eat, you're dead. Satan changed all that, lest you die. No, you're going to die. Chapter 5 is the obituary. Chapter 5, the bell tolls. And he died. Satan said, you should not surely die. They died. Adam lived 962. He died. I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed. See it? So this is where Cain was such a rebel and disobedient because he brought that which was cursed. And that's what religion does. Religion brings baptism, church membership, good works, good neat deeds, but they don't bring the blood. Where's the blood? No blood, there's no salvation. See it? Notice. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow, so the woman in conception, the man in sorrow shall thou eat of it all the days of thy life. You think Adam and Eve worked in the garden? Well, Adam tilled the garden, though, didn't he? He's a gardener. He's a farmer. And I think, I think if you're right with God as a man, you like nice grass. My opinion. I think if you're right with God, I cut my grass yesterday and then this morning I sat in the office and I smelled that new, nice, fragrant, something about gra green grass. It's not in the message, but I just thought I'd, because I, I smell that green grass. Amen. Oh, me. And sorrow shall thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns. Also, and thistles. I, I thank the ladies of our church who take care of the weeds, bring the flowers, and now the flowers are gone. And I thank you who came this week, and I know who you are. I saw you up here, and you took care of and got rid of all the dead stuff. It's all dead now. But spring is coming, and if we live to spring, I hope we're not here in the spring. hope we're there in the spring. That'd be all right. I like to be there in the spring. That means he's come. That means you don't have to pay off your mortgage. That means you don't have to worry about illness and so forth. I pray every day, whoever that last Gentile is, get him saved so we can get out of here. Thorns and thistles shall thou bring forth to thee, and, and thou shalt, notice, bring forth to thee, 
and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face. How many of you sweat at work? Do you sweat? Do you sweat? Nothing like sweat. Women, they perspire, but us men, we sweat. And that sweat, and you're working, and that's how you got to get your food. And the sweat of thy face shall thou eat bread. I wish I could eat bread. I can't eat bread. I eat bread, I look like the uh, Michelin tire guy. <laughs> I get rolls around my belly. And uh, Sunday night, Sunday night, I got in an accident after church, and I went to uh, Pizza Pizza <laughs> and got that, that bread. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to bring to someone, but they didn't answer their phone, so I had to eat it. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I can't eat bread. Is something wrong with my belly with bread? I don't know. And I'm thinking about dairy. Anyway, swear thy face shall thou eat bread. Oh, I wish I could. Man, I just love nice hot bread and, and extra virgin olive oil and garlic. And oh, my goodness. Can't have it. I have to have gluten stuff. Anyway, crying, not crying, just telling you the truth. Till thou return unto the ground, for out of it was thou taken, dust thou art, dust thou shalt return. Now, chapter 4. Chapter 4. And look at verse 2. And this is why so imperative. Now, I don't know, there's, is there something about Filipino people when you have a new baby, you can't come to church for several months. Is that, is that, is that something? I think, is that, yeah, because I know you didn't. But there's a lady here just had a baby, and it's been since August, and she's still not coming to church. So I don't know, maybe there's something about uh, staying home or something. I don't know. But the point is, those little babies, and I said earlier, the nursery, Auntie Levy said, let's, let's teach them the word of God. And by the way, we have a whole plan there in the nursery that Mrs. Glennon has written up for them to, to be busy. L nursery shouldn't be babysitting. Nursery should not be babysitting. There's a whole plan there of what to do and every few moments to keep them busy. Because a child's, a child's retention is about four minutes. Four minutes and they're gone. And I think some of you are about seven minutes and you're gone. <laughs> But uh, adults a little bit more, but about four minutes. And uh, so we have a plan for them, to keep them busy, and yet to keep them busy. But my point is in verse 2 is this. Don't you think that Adam and Eve did not throw away those, those coats of skin? I'll guarantee you they didn't throw them away. I guarantee you they saved them and showed those baby boys when they were babies. We fell, we sinned, daddy and mama sinned, and God loved us and he covered us and he slayed an innocent animal and shed the blood of that innocent lamb, prefiguring the one who would come, the Lord Jesus, the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Don't you think he explained that to those two boys? Don't you think she explained that to those boys? And notice, and she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of the sheep. Cain was a tiller of the ground. Nothing wrong with taking care of the ground. Nothing wrong with fruit. Nothing wrong with vegetables. I like vegetables, fruit, and uh, that kind of stuff. I like just about everything, but I've never had, I don't think I've ever had okra. I don't know what okra is about, but I don't know. Is it, uh, I don't know. I think you, maybe you have to eat okra in heaven. I don't know, but I've never had okra. And I don't think I've ever had collard greens. And uh, I may have had collard greens, I don't know. But uh, I sure like, uh, anyway. So, keeper of the ground. So, good fruit, good vegetables. Cain has little, bah, bah, little lambs running around. Abel is taking care of the lambs. Cain's taking care of the food source. And probably has nice little flowers and a little garden. And the process of time, now here's the point. And the process of time, we'd say this about our children at the age of accountability. If we, if we get the word of God in our children 
and get God's word in their heart and teach them to pray. A little boy was praying at the foot of his bed. Now I lay me down to sleep. Bid the Lord my soul to take. If I should keep, if I should die before I wake, bid the Lord my soul to take. God bless mommy, God bless daddy. And then the little boy said, Mama, Mama, how come you and daddy don't pray? How come you and daddy don't pray? Convicted the mother. So taking that time to sit and teach our children to pray and, and to know the Bible stories and, and what God has to say. So somehow they brought the process of time, it came to pass. So this was a specific time at a specific altar they were coming to make an offering. Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. Sure, it was good fruit, but it wasn't what God asked for. Verse number five, or verse four. And Abel, he also brought, you see that? So by faith, he brought. On faith, or no faith, Cain brought. Cain knew there was weeds in his garden, bugs in his garden. You ever get fruit from the store and there's a spider in it? I wash grapes very carefully. Spider in the grape. Did you know this? I'm going to give you a little something free tonight to help you out. You should have a banana before you go to bed. Do you know why? Bananas will help you to sleep. Banana, everybody's going to run out and buy bananas. <laughs> you should have a banana before you go to bed. Did you know that? It has melatonin in it. Banana. So I just helped uh, the banana business. <laughs> but anyway, so fruit. And uh, I like fruit. As Glenn and I eat a lot of fruit, vegetables and stuff. But notice. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock. He brought the best. We ought to give God the best. You heard the story about the missionary, Africa, and there was a crocodile god, and a family in, in their neighborhood had twin babies. One was deformed, other was not, and they knew that the family would be offering one of those babies to the crocodile god. Sure enough, met the family coming back, and you, you thought they would come back with a, with a good baby. <laughs> no, they came back with a crippled baby. They offered the best baby to the crocodile god. True story, a missionary told the story. We ought to give God our best, our best time. Our best offering ought to be to the Lord. Honor him with the substance. So, and for those of us tonight, and with the exception of maybe a few not here, we're keeping this thing together by God's grace. But to give, and to give our best, to give the best in your sermon. I want to preach the best that God will help me to do, and he will help me because I ask him to help me. But I want to preach the best, and I want to be faithful to preach his word and, and to teach our teachers much prayer, much power. And our men, much prayer, much power. And he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. That means he killed it. He killed it. He sacrificed it. Or he wouldn't have had no fat. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. Not unto Abel, but the offering. But unto Cain, now by the way, God is not a respecter of persons. God didn't take Abel over Cain. No, that wasn't the point. The point was in the offering. The offering. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had no respect. And Cain was very wroth. Cain had a temper problem. Your kid has a temper problem, you need to take them out and whip their little butts. <laughs> Would I say that on the internet? Yeah. yeah, They have a temper. Don't let them control you with their temper. They start whining and so forth. Take care of that. Amen? Bible says you deliver their soul from hell. I know it hurts, but it's necessary. And Cain was very rough. Cain was throwing a fit. Why do you think he killed his brother? 
couldn't stand it. And his countenance fell. He had a poochy lip. He was pouting. And the Lord said to Cain, Why art thou wroth? Why are you angry? And why is thy countenance fallen? What's your problem? Why are you so ashy in the face, Cain? What happened, Cain? Your peacock chest not sticking out so much now, is it? You brought that fruit, that vegetables. It's cursed. I cursed it. But now notice God gives a second chance. If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? Not by your works, not by your religion, not by your self-righteousness, but faith in the blood. If thou doest not well, here it is, there's a lamb outside the door, there's a lamb outside the tent door, grab one of Abel's lamb and offer it, I'll receive you. Sin lieth at the door. There's a sin offering at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother, as anger. So many people angry. You know, there is, devil has, someone said this, I forget who it was. I think it was J. Vernon McGee. The devil has no happy old people. I don't ever want to be old and cantankerous and miserable. So I like to play with the young children, give them candy and ice cream and stuff. I want to be around some life. Amen? Mm -hmm. <sighs> Just look at this verse. What a heartbreaking verse. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass. It came to pass, beloved. When they were in the field, this is premeditated murder. While they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother. Did he stab him? Did he hit him with a rock? I don't know, but God says, Thy brother's blood crieth unto me. Slew him. Lord said unto Cain, Where's thy brother? Where's Abel, thy brother? And here's the excuse. Where is Abel, thy brother? And he said, I know not. Yes, you do. You killed your brother. I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? He asked Eve, What did you do? He asked Adam, What have you done? Did you eat from the fruit that I said not to eat of? What have you done? God brings about responsibility and accountability. What have you done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. Imagine all the babies, the millions of babies murdered. I was preaching Sunday night. I said Sunday night, I preached in the devil, the devil attacks my wife. Well, he attacked me Sunday night. And the devil showed up Sunday night. And this guy said while I was preaching, no love, no love. Really? No love? I preached about sodomites. I preached about corrupt government. If they wanted God, they could have God. They don't want God. And God has given them up to a reprobate mind. And judgment day is going to fall. It's like it fell on Cain. And Cain said, my, my punishment is greater than I can bear. I challenge you to look through these verses and see if God made it any lighter for him. And now thou cursed from the earth which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shall it be in the earth. And Cain said, The Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Well, he's in hell now. The way of Cain will leave you to hell. Canaanites are Abelites. Canaanites or Abelites. Canaanites go to hell. Abelites go to heaven because they come under the blood. Go back to Hebrews 11 and we're done. Abel offered unto God by faith. By faith. Looking to the cross. Looking to the Lamb of God that takes away the sin 
of the world. No blood, you have no salvation. By faith, Abel offered unto God, that, that process of time, at that altar, Abel went and got the best little lamb of his flock, slit its throat, took the blood, and poured it on the altar. By faith, Abel offered to God, notice now, a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Cain brought fruit and vegetables that were cursed. Cain said, you take my way or forget it. That's what religion says. And religion kills Christians. Catholics murdered 50 million of them during the Dark Ages. The Crusade, they were killing Christians. And if you went to Mexico, deep Mexico, they're still killing Christians. They're not changed. They won't come by the way of the blood. They come by the way of their sacraments. You hate Catholic people? Of course not. I'm preaching against their leaders. Say, mean-spirited preacher. Read Psalms, read Matthew 23. Jesus said you're a bunch of snakes and vipers. How, John the Baptist, how should you escape the judgment of hell? That's Bible preaching. People don't like that. They're like a little Casper, milk toast, lovey-dovey, shiver coat, little... Uh -huh. Are you okay? I'm okay. More excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness. Now, what was, what was Abel's faith about? He had, number one, worshiping faith. He went down on his knees. When the wise man came to Jesus as a young boy, they bowed down and they worshiped him. Abel had worshiping faith. He came by the way of the blood. And that testimony was a witness for him. He went down. Each of these four that we're going to talk about, they went somewhere. He obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts. And by it, he being dead yet speaketh. Wow. Abel's faith. And if you are saved tonight, those of us who are saved, we came by the way of the blood. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission for sin. I'll put the, what are you going to do? Moses put the blood on the doorpost and the lentil, and when I see the blood, the Passover, I will pass over you. It's the blood. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. <coughs> oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Let's pray. <coughs> oh, Lord, how the world has covered up true Christianity. How religion is in the forefront. The dress of many people that go to church. The music. The versions. The messages. How sad. How very sad. The charlatans. Those preachers that are in it for the money. Those preachers that are in it for the wrong reason. Have mercy. And Lord, have mercy on our city. In our mall. In our very mall, our little town, our mall. The picking up children. Human trafficking in Fort McMurray, have mercy. The government has so far removed the Bible and prayer and are anti-God and anti-Christian. So we must stand. 
We must be faithful in these declining days. And Lord, we thank you for the blood. We thank you for the faith once delivered to the saints. Help us to keep on keeping on. Help us to be more about our prayer time. Prayer, first of all, or not at all. Help us to be a praying people. Help us to be a praying church. And Lord, help us to open up our hearts to your will for our lives. And Lord, help us to pull up the sinner, hell bound, encourage the saint, heaven bound, and help us to be Bible people. Help us to be faithful. Help us, O oh God, to have tenacity and conviction and character and help our conduct to be right. Oh, the temptations today to the young people and adults and adults, how Satan so easily allures us, the songwriter wrote. Oh, how our hearts are tempted to sin. I must tell Jesus, Jesus will help me. Jesus alone. Heads are bowing, our eyes are closed. God speak to your heart tonight about some matter of your walk with him. By the way, if you have no worship, you cannot walk. If you have no worship, you cannot work for the Lord. These three men, Abel, Enoch, and Noah, is the way of salvation. Salvation through Abel by worship. Enoch walked with God. And the Bible says that Noah walked with God. Two men of those three, and certainly Abel, walked with you, walked with the Lord. So while our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, may I pray for you experientially this evening, what's going on in your life, your prayer time, Bible time, witnessing, working for the Lord. Time is short. How short, I have no idea, but I know he's coming. Preacher, remember me in closing prayer tonight. God spoke to my heart. Remember me tonight. God spoke to my heart. Amen. You may take them down. And so, Father, I like to read old sermons. You know that. Listen to the old guys. Lord, if they were around today, they would weep pools of, of tears. Pools of tears to see how we've left it. How we as preachers have not done our part to be faithful and to stand true. Help us, Lord. And thank you for our church and the church family. And Lord, those who love you and want to do right. And those who, Lord, are away from you. And they have gotten caught up. Nobody meant to get caught up, but this pandemic scared everybody for a season. And then they got so caught up that so many have chosen friends from the world. And now it's hard for them to stand up and to walk away from those worldly friends. It's hard for them to take a stand for you because They've forgotten where they put their Bibles. They've forgotten how to pray. God have mercy. And help us to stand true. Help us to continue to give out the word and be faithful in our walk. Lord, we're the only examples that the lost and the saved will ever see will be us. Enoch walked with you. Noah walked with you in an unbelievable, unbelievable time. Everyone, everyone 
with the exception of eight, did that which is wicked continuously. So Lord, help us to stand the tide and to be faithful. And Lord, to be determined to do right and live right and to walk right. Help us to be the examples that we need to be in our home and out in public. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.